It's July 2nd, 2020, and this is Rook. Is there any greater ambassador of Persian culture than the food? Is it ever too soon for a meal of Khorishta Badem Jum? Well, if you know Iranians or you are Iranian, you will know that the problem can be that Persians can get pretty proprietary about their cuisine. You're going to use those beans in the osh? Don't spice up the sabzi polo. And sorry, we don't do korma sabzi with chicken. So what happens when a widely acclaimed Persian chef makes the case that you can make the food however you want, including vegan and vegetarian varieties? Hos Zare joins me today, now the executive chef at Google, to share his story and his mission to bring Iranian food to the world. I'm Gian Gameshi. This is Rook. Okay, hi there. Welcome to episode number 23 of Rook. Oh, hi, Captain Reza Chaturi. <laughs> I, you've been upgraded to oh, hi, Captain Reza. Ooh, I don't know why. Title on top of title. I like that. <laughs> Shaya Jun? I'm very fine. How are you? I'm well, very well. Thank you, Groovy Shaya. And Kion, hi. Salam, Gion John. Salam, Kion John. Um, Kion, I have a question for you. Shoot. This is, we are, uh, we're in that moment where we've just passed Canada Day, mm-hmm. a big celebration for those of us who live in Canada and who are Canadian, like myself. But we are just uh, uh, awaiting Independence Day. It is imminent the U.S. uh, July 4th celebrations. You were born in Des Moines, Iowa. I was. You live in Canada Mm -hmm. and grew up here for the most part, but both of your parents are Iranian. Very Iranian. So, you ready for my question? Yes. Nowruz versus Canada Day versus Independence Day. That's a tough question. How do you rank the three in the key on life? No ruse was always a big deal in our household. I think, you know, it's our ancestors fought long and hard to preserve this part of our culture so it's always big big right. um, I can't pick a second and third so for you me, hate you hate Canada Day. I love Canada <laughs> yeah, and you hate, ca- you hate <laughs> Canadians and Americans I knew this was coming it's an anti <laughs> so it's very split for me f- between Canada Day and Independence Day because I have relatives on both sides and I never want to make it seem like I over celebrate one and don't you can't post other. pictures of you I, with like a Canadian flag do, on your cheek yeah. if I do Canada Day I have to do an Independence Day Wow. otherwise I get very angry Such messages you're not divided, American or divided you're not loyalties. Canadian. by the way Shai you're you're more recent to Canada from uh, Iran yes. do you yes. do you enjoy the the Canada Day celebrations uh, I do I did actually yes oh. uh, we we had barbecue in a oh. backyard and nice. yeah that was Good for you yeah and, and it's weird it sounds like Charshambe Suri <laughs> in downtown <laughs> Toronto. Fireworks. Talk to That's the other word <laughs> that people use in Canada for Canada Day. They, they're like, uh, hey, yeah. you guys celebrating Char Shambi? That's right. Char, That's Char, Char, Char Shambi. They, they, they say it like that. Uh, okay. Well, I hope you guys are uh, post-barbecue. I hope you're not too hungry because... Um, uh, we've got a chef on, and every time we start talking food, especially oh. Persian food, uh, Kion, we'll see you in a little bit with uh, letters with Kion, yes. Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. Let's get Haas on the phone. My guest today is a San Francisco-based chef, renowned in the culinary world for his distinctive style that reframes and heightens Iranian cuisine while simultaneously making it accessible. Born in Iran, Chef Hass Zareh grew up on his family's farm in Tabriz. In the mid-1980s, he immigrated to San Francisco, where he started on a culinary journey that would lead to spotlighting the complex flavors of Persian food combined with Mediterranean cuisine. So creating this 
combination of textures, ingredients, and innovative preparation and presentations. Throughout his career that stretches over more than 25 years, Chef Haas has held leadership positions in a few prominent restaurants in San Francisco. He owned and operated the famed Flytrap restaurant from 2008 to 2016, during which time he began to draw from the flavors and memories of his childhood and in his unique style. Chef Haas has received numerous awards and has been the subject of several publications. Currently, he is the executive chef at Google with the Bon Appetit Management Company, and he is working on a memoir and recipe book dedicated to his parents. Right now, Chef Haas Zada joins me from San Francisco, California. Hello, sir. Hello there. Thanks for having me. I am humbled to be in part of your show. It is uh, it's such an honor to have you. And I think you know this, but my mom's from Tabriz, so I feel like we're brothers, right? We can start as brothers? Ah, absolutely. <laughs> we, we, just, I have to be careful. We don't start talking Turkish in the middle of the uh, conversation. <laughs> you, you can start talking Turkish, but only my mother will understand. I won't understand. So it's up to you if you want to speak in code. You know... Um, yeah. Uh, Haas, the, the last time we had a chef on this program, my mouth was watering as we started talking about Persian food. Uh, I, I assume, do you have that effect on people? Is everyone hungry when you're around? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, my problem when I talk about food, I first I excite salvation myself because I, 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 I have a problem. When I talk about food, I get excited. And then I remember uh, we had a panel in Boston with the Iranian uh, at uh, Harvard. And in the panel, we were talking after they did on purpose after lunch, so people would be full. But when I start talking, 10 minutes later, one of the gentlemen, uh, he's a famous Iranian actor, he started complaining that, hey, guys, we have another lunch later on, and this one, I'm getting hungry. So that was a great compliment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely going to be true. I feel it already. Listen, I would be remiss if I didn't start this interview noting that uh, COVID-19 cases are on the rise again in a big way where you are in California. Uh, of course, I hope we're, that you're staying safe. Uh, when we spoke to Chef Hamid Salminyan last, last month, he actually said that this has led to an increase in cooking at home for him. Is that, is that true for you too, or is cooking too much related to work for you? Uh, no, actually, uh, for me, it's, I am always at home. I'm experimenting. I'm cooking when I have a free time. And when I had a restaurant, I was pretty much doing that one in the early morning before my staff gets to the restaurant, like eight o'clock. I used to get there four or five o'clock and experiment. And sometimes I had a happy face when they arrived. Sometimes I had a frustration for it. So anyway, but back to home on Saturday, Sunday, and day off, I always like to cook. I used to cook, and on Sunday, especially, my, my friends join me. And I always cook at home, but right now, I cook, but it's more on um, social media showing at the beginning, but you get excited, but then you have this leftover, and you are you are one person, what are you gonna do with extra food? It become <laughs> a waste. So <laughs> that was my little dilemma. So cooking is not necessarily entirely a job for you still. I mean, you don't you don't hate it because you think, oh God, uh, the last thing I wanna do when I come home is cook. I've been cooking all day. Well, the day I feel that way, I get a cooking job for me, I will quit, I am dead. That's two options because for me, I have played professional soccer. I have done a lot of difference in my life. I came to go to med school here. I went through the UC Davis, but I always wanted something to make me every day excited. So the cooking is something uh, I find it never makes me tired, and every time I do is joyful for me. Okay. You know, I've got so much to get to with you, but nowhere in the research and in all the the, the reading I've done and, and watching of uh, interviews you've done in the past, nowhere have I heard that you were a professional soccer player. What What is <laughs> I, that you can't just say that without me asking about it? Where were you a soccer player? Well, I tab I started playing and I in, uh, chosen for the Iran, Iranian youth soccer team. And then when I went to actually coming to us i was being selected to this uh, as team in uh, germany but then it was a choice between to come to san francisco or stay in europe play soccer i just chose to come here wow um listen this is an interesting move for you in the last uh, three or four years you are an executive chef at bon appetit management company designing recipes and menus that showcase persian food for these thousands of google employees and visitors each day 
How does a celebrated chef like you, who's owned several restaurants in the San Francisco Bay Area, decide to work for a corporation? Tell me about that move. Uh, great question. I am going to make it short and sweet as much as I can. I always enjoy having restaurants and people, they used to say, when you eat, I say, I eat with my eyes. When I see my customers hmm. happy, their movement, and those are the one uh, uh, reward for me. But my whole life changed since 2007 when the tragedy of my family happened. Yes. My parents got murdered. So that changed the whole subject that, okay, how I can uh, be in peace myself, what I can do, what I can make my parents proud or my family. So I said, okay, I am a chef. I have a best tool in my hand. I know I am a, a, a pretty much work a French Italian cuisine. My, my favorite food used to, I mean, I was almost did a Italian cuisine. Then I realized that I got a comfortable med meditation zone with, with cooking Persian food, Iranian food. So that's the reason I opened the fly trap to bring my memories, my childhood memories, to be in peace with myself and also transfer that peace to the people. We have an amazing cuisine. Even I can make a statement, better than French cuisine. Our food is not just the gourmet food. It's based on the health aspects, nutritious values, everything has been uh, done. So I noticed, told myself, I'm gonna make as much as I can, use the tool, not only get the people to know the Persian Iranian food, but also our culture, our beautiful culture. So I use the cooking as a introducing the culture to two. So the fly trap became a tool. And but again, this is the why you have the rock. I can talk rock. Yes. I didn't want to call it Iranian food because I was gonna be finger up, hands up, this is not Iranian food, this is what complain. I didn't open the fly trap for Iranian. I opened for American, I called it no, in general, everybody, I called it Mediterranean cuisine with Persian flair. Because I'm Iranian, I am I have spices. So with that, I even named, like for example, for cash bottom, you know, I wrote it, uh, braised eggplant with sun-dried yogurt. Okay, wait a second. So, wait, 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 wait. Yes. I want to get to all of this. <laughs> You're okay. slow down, slow down. We got so much to get to, and you've said so much that I want to pick up on there. So let me let me just situate because it, your, your story is a fascinating one, and I want to make sure that everybody hears every step of this. So let's just start right now. You're doing this this work at Google uh, with with serving these these people at this uh, big corporation. And my question was, my thought was that why at this stage you've decided? I just thought we'd start in the present and then work backwards. So why yeah. you've decided at this stage to work for someone rather than being the boss, even even though I would imagine of all the places to work in the world, that's probably the safest gig in the world is working at Google because sure. it's, it's not going anywhere, sure. you know, but uh, <laughs> tell me why that, that, why you made that move. Yeah, that was, I was trying to build a base, like a building. So I started a restaurant and we go back there for eight years. And I noticed that is a small uh, uh, area for me. I want to go bigger. So I work, I went first time ever I worked with Bonaparte Appetit Management Company. And I did a consultative style. I traveled for a year and a half for 13 states. I trained their chef. We did a little inside book. And I trained their chef for technique and per Iranian food on the 13 different, 12, 13 states. Each time they brought their executive chef, 30 of them. So we did a little like a workshop station. But my love for my country made me to go to Google because at Google as a chef for Bon Appetit, I am interested in the food for larger crowd half i can not tell too much about the google because they have a privacy right but i can we at the silicon valley every day we serve eighty thousand meal around wow. the world two hundred fifty thousand meal or a million so if i can be able to have a five percent of this food iranian concept food every day as you're talking about the twelve thousand five hundred people Eating Iranian Persian Well, that foods. makes a lot of sense. I had no idea that it's that that we're talking about two hundred fifty thousand uh, stomachs that you're that you're feeding through this. And and so what you were just saying there is is that you are not only uh, one of the executive chefs that, that that obviously specializes in Persian cuisine, but you are teaching the other Bon Appetit chefs how to make Persian food. Exactly. So my title is Mediterranean cuisine, basically. So it's not just a Persian food happens to be under the same umbrella. So I go from like a Lebanese, Turkish, 
Iranian, Afghanistan, that region, Mediterranean. And I edit the recipes. My job title is basically food programmer, recipe developer, and concept designer. For example, when I went to Google, this is fascinating. One of the cafe was only twice a month was serving for Iranian food, and I wasn't good. So in six months, seven months, I was so proud of me and my team. We had eight cafe was serving the Persian food. Hmm. In the same month, we served 38 meals in one month. That was fascinating for me. And it was a feedback because what we do, not only we do Persian food, but for example, gourmet sabzi or Korsha sharafs. When I do that one, I'm not just doing it with the meat. I have to plan to do that one as a vegan and vegetarian. Right, I did it, for right. example, Korsha sharafs. Instead of gush uh, meat, I added uh, artichoke hearts. <laughs> it was a okay, hang on. Let me get to the, the, the vegetarian because I, that's very interesting to me. But first of all, when I read that when you're teaching uh, this Persian cuisine, and in terms of the menu that you have at the Persian pantry the, at, at Google, there's 80, 80, 80 authentic and contemporary recipes. Um, that and Now, maybe this is under this Mediterranean umbrella you're talking about, so it's not all Iranian, but this is full of fresh, fresh green herbs, spices, stews that are, it says, indigenous to the various regions of Iran. Now, I'm going to say something here that probably is going to... Um, out me as naive or or, <laughs> or or foolish to a lot of the you know people of Iranian descent listening but I've always felt like the Iranian menu in terms of our main dishes is actually quite limited like you go to an Iranian restaurant and it's pretty much the same 10 15 dishes to get you know like you get your uh, chelo kebab or qurma sabzi or fesenjun or it's you know it's the same list usually from place to place so is there any truth in that or is it just that most Persian restaurants or someone like me would not have been exposed to the dozens of different recipes that you clearly are involved in? Well, this is a huge issue. We can write about book. That your question was absolutely, you almost opened the wound right now. I can complain. Our, even in Iran, you go there, the same problem. They have the, the most uh, travelers. Like when I went to Iran after 30 years, I came, I encouraged other people to go. They, when they came back because I helped them to go to Iran, come back, American, the only complaint was we got sick and tired of chelo kebab and zuji kebab and gourmet <laughs> right. But we have amazing food selection. But we do the same thing here. Only gourmet sabzi, fish in June, and this and that. I put an Ashit and Duni to Google. Iranian house, what is Ashid and Duni? I said, go ask your mom. Maybe they will know that. Wait, what, what is that? Uh, uh, Ashi, the, what was it? Ashid and Duni. Uh, Ashid and Duni. Uh, it's it's this different this from Ashid. Ashid Ash and Duni. Uh, there is a, a soup kind of made when the kids, that, uh, that they had a first teeth coming up. They gather in the lake. It is they want to gather together and they used to make it that Ash. So how, is it, how is it different from regular Ash? Or is it... It's basically a lot of uh, 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 legumes and uh, grains in it, and it's a it's nothing for the baby. It's just a, a little little acidic in it, and it's very delicious. Mm -hmm. And um, sounds like good. I said, I have it in Google right now. I have ten different ashes. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, please continue. I I, I cut yeah. you in the middle of no. It was the a wound that you were, no, I The opened, point yeah. I have is here. We have always were like as Iranian people catered for us. We used to cook at home. When you do any dishes, oh, my mom makes it better. My, my So most cafes and restaurants, they open here. They are sticking with it. some stuff is harder for the at home to make, kebabs, for example. And little luxury. But when they want to make like a khorish tebe, quince, it's too delicious. But they, you don't never see it in the restaurant because they're not going to buy it. Uh, they know they can make it at home. Sure. Or again, half a rook. When they go to art, they don't so how this plate cost for food. How much is it cost? Or oh, too expensive. Why the Horish is too is it's eighteen dollars. But organically grown, they want the best. So we have little um when it comes to restaurant cuisine, uh, again, young generation are doing great, but it's still we are not in that level. We can uh, encourage our sons and daughters, our family go become a chef. Chef job becoming a huge and it is huge, but in not Iranian culture, it's a like a, almost a, a, a low cl class job used to be. Now, uh -huh. it, after this, uh, this many years, a lot of uh, 
excitement happening, especially with the Corona thing, right now, it, it's good and bad. You see in the, uh, Instagram, everybody's blogger and food writers. But it sounds like you should not just be training the non-Iranian chefs at Google, but uh, a lot of Iranian chefs themselves could benefit from the training <laughs> of the fundamental, te- the different flavors and variations on Persian cooking you're talking about, right? Absolutely, absolutely. That's the point. Right now, we are with the chef from Iran here. We have opened a site in the tra- traditional uh, Persian food on the Instagram. We are encouraging chefs and non chefs from Iran to share the recipe in the uh, Telegram with us with the pictures and recipe, and we choose and we post it there. So it's a great site. Again, this is not an advertising. We try, only advertising we have is Iran, our culture, our food. Every culture you want to introduce is a food. Three times a day we eat. You can introduce the culture, nothing better tools than the food. But the excuse for us in the United States or other we write, oh, we cannot find this, we cannot find. Right. But for me as a chef, after 30 years, 35 years cooking, I can change that one with the flavors of the other spices, other vegetables to come close for that. So you you mentioned that uh, as you're designing these recipes at Google, you often or maybe regularly have to do a vegan or ve- vegetarian option as well because clearly you're dealing with thousands of, of people and, and some of them are going to be vegetarian and you have to, you have to work with them. You have to uh, make this work for them. Uh, and it's funny with Persian food. I want to ask you about this because it can be very meat-based traditionally. It, we, if we, we think of it in terms of the staples as meat, right? The kind of, the kind of meat you would, uh, uh, whether it's lamb or beef. Or, and, and as you talk, as you say, I mean, if we think of, immediately think of chela kebab or uh, kebabs or, or qomer sabzi or fesenjun, the, these, these dishes are all infused with meat. And I have a, <laughs> a funny story around this, which is that for many years I was vegetarian, and uh, right around the late 90s, um, uh, you know, it's, since I was in my early 20s, I was a vegetarian. And my, my sister had gone, or maybe it was the early 2000s, she had gone to Iran and told some of my relatives, and there was one, one relative when my sister said, he's vegetarian, he doesn't eat meat. They had said, oh, bichare marize, she should, you know, they, they <laughs> <laughs> is he sick? What's wrong with him? Because they couldn't conceive at that time, this is only 20 years ago, that, that there would be, you know, somebody who would choose not to eat meat when it comes to, to Persian food. And yet, our food is, and I know that's changed, and there's a lot of Persian vegetarians now, so I'm not suggesting that uh, I was somehow unique, but yet there are so many vegetables and legumes and herbs and fruits that are used in our food that you would think Persian food is actually the ultimately vegetarian-friendly food. So tell me about that disconnect between the way we've always seen it and what the possibilities are for Persian food. Well, great question. Uh, actually, the, this happened in the last few months. We are at home. We working from home editing. We were taking classes also. The, one of the classes was a plant-based food, uh, plant forward. And I was like, when I, my turn came to talk, I say, this is nothing new for me. If you guys open your eyes, it was happened to my culture for years. It, let's look at the Persian food. Yes, we have a lot of meat in there. Kebab was a luxury occasional not always we eat the kebab we have a lot of stews and and let's look at our stews they all has amazing legumes like you say mentioned it legumes grains uh, herbs fruits nuts so that's a plant base and then what they ask him for plant based they don't say you don't want to be a vegetarian or a vegan add instead of six eight ten ounces of meat or one pound of meat two ounces three ounces for flavor even if you don't add that meat the base has already your 55 grams of protein your body needs. They used to be a big family, it's live together, like 15, 20 people, son, they have a wife and kids. They were lots of mouth to feed. So they nobody was having half a pound or one pound of meat at home. So they would take it like a two pounds equal to one kilo, chop it up, put it in the stew, and between 15 people eat that one. So if you look at that one, we are not was it that heavy meat eaters. Mm-hmm. With the technology right now, people are asking for, right now if you go to Iran, everyone wants a steak. They want the biggest cut of the meat. This is new for us. Used to be every cover of food is designed on minimized meat protein versus a lot of legumes and grains and herbs and flavor and spices. 
But some of this intersects with with uh, expectations or these traditional notions of what is right. I mean, you would know more than anyone that the way Persians can be very <laughs> conservative about this is the way it has to be made. And so there's this notion, for example, that Lubia Polo or Korma Sabzi that, that doesn't have meat in it isn't really Korma Sabzi then. It's not really Lubia Polo. It's because, because the only way that it would really be that is if it had the meat in it. True. But there are two ways of looking at that. One is to look at, okay, yeah, you can say this is Lubia Polo, but without meat. Okay, so, but you serve with a non Iranian. If you, two, if you want to make that one, what is our ethnicity of our food? Like, for example, Koreshde Geime. Is it Iranian exactly? I can say no, because tomato and potato was introduced to us after Columbus, Christopher Columbus discovered the South America. Vanilla potato to came Europe and to Iran. So how nobody complained when they introduced the tomatoes on every single recipe, <laughs> tomato base, to our cuisine. Right. Now if somebody wants to take the beat out, do something, there's a thing, hands are up on the air complaining. So my right. ears are full of that always. I always let it from my ear from out in and outside out. I did what I have been doing and I've been successful. And this is what I tell the Iranian chefs. Follow you what you feel like it and just do it. There's going to be a few people that are going to complain. But is everything okay? I mean, is any... Ver like if I make Gorma Sabzi with juje there, with chicken, is that okay? Absolutely. You're going to eat it, not me. You're, you're a chef, but... <laughs> so the bottom line... I. I, we have basic ideas about the food, like a gourmet sabzi, a Korish game, eh, but we cannot always say this is exactly the recipe always been. My mom made the one soup that my, I love, chicken soup, noodle soup. My six sisters make all differently. They learn from one person. So imagine this passes generation, right. how it's going to be changed for next generation. So the, the food evolved through the history. And by the way, I mean you would know this as well, but if you if you want to learn how to make Fesenjun and you you ask your mother and you find a, a Persian cookbook and you go to YouTube, they all say different things. <laughs> so it's really <laughs> hard you. to be, depending on what the region is, depending on you know what the lineage is, depending on on what was available. It's it there's variations, right? Well, the rock again the, the name of the your show rock. Uh, look at all the Iranian cookbooks out there. What's the difference from each other? Nothing. They're all the same. Just except a few items changes, like the same Gorn Masabs has been written 100,000 times. In Iran, uh, they make it uh, with the Tehran, the red beans, right? Lubia Germes. Yes. In Tabriz, you make it with the uh, black eyed peas. So that's okay. So now in San Francisco in the, or in Toronto, in the, you have this beautiful hybrid, beautiful beans that are developed. And delicious and but for example at zuki beans i can put it at zuki bean inside of that beans so who's gonna complain nobody i am just using the new ingredients and making dish more developed and sometimes i say i have been inspired by iranian gourmet sabzi and i made it mine with at zuki beans inside of the red beans mm. so Haas, how proprietary should we be about persian cuisine and, and the names, Farsi names for it. I mean, I've noticed that Persian cuisine is increasingly becoming a culinary trend these days, but but Persian names for dishes are sometimes not used. So I've come across restaurants where, for example, Kuku Sabzi was served, but it's called Frittata. What, what is your take on that? I had experience I can share with you. When I had the fly trap, uh, suddenly, even though I've, I've, at the beginning I started with old English name, but I, I had a white server perfectly trained to tell them to bring the customers to the, learn the food first. That scared them. For fun, for two weeks, I changed the names of all Persian words, right? And, you know, I love my country. I say, okay, Italian, they do, I'm going to do it. Right. My business went 40% down. Really? Why? Because people, they look at the menu, they get scared. So what I do, I put them, like for example, at Google, I put the main name in English and underneath, I put the name uh, written in the uh, uh, Iranian language, Farsi. Haas, let me, let me get, uh, we'll come back to your contemporary work and what you're doing in San Francisco. Let me ask you a little bit about your personal story because it's an interesting one. Take me back to your days when you were a young boy in, in Iran. 
what are your earliest memories of Persian cuisine in Iran? I mean, did it did it captivate you back then? Be rook about this if it didn't. I mean, if you were just too busy playing soccer, or, or was it? <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, was it was it something that you did you understand the magical seduction of Persian food while you were there, or was it something you discovered after you had left? I always like that. I always hang out in the kitchen, hang out with my mom in the kitchen. We had actually my dad when he had a mehuni the uh, party. He used to invite this chef, Chef Jamshid, to, we had a one a kitchen in the house, one in the outside the yard, other side we called the mutbak. Uh, it was a big one for the big parties. I used to just go sit there and watch him and just to make it friendly from the, with him so he allows me in the kitchen. So one condition, don't tell my recipe to anybody if you see it. And I used to bring him every day I had a, a turkey. And I used to go get the ter- eggs from Turkey, bring them to him as a gift, so he can allow me to sit next to him, watch him what he's cooking. So I had a pretty much a really uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, food and smell, and we always uh, we had a big fruit farms, and we used to get together and cook some basic food, but not that extensive cooking heavy. The whole thing food came to me in the United States. I became being a chef. When the revolution happens, you're you're a teenager. And then, uh, as I understand it, by the time, by your early 20s, you are serving in the front lines of the Iran-Iraq war. And you end up leaving Iran in 1985. Um, what, what can you tell me about that? must have been a particularly difficult time for you. What can you tell me about that time? Well, when you're young, you make decisions uh, from the emotion, sometimes from your heart. For me, I die for my country. But I, if I know my own people's gonna get killed in between, I try to avoid that one. And I served my country two years. I'm proud of that. And one year I would spend the front to protect my country. But at the time, the country wasn't stable, and um, we live it that way. And they were anything you did was wrong. And there were lots of innocent people got killed in between. So for me, just trying to, and also I switched my service to stay at home and take care of my parents. My parents say, you know what, son, you are young and you're not going to have a future here. You're going to get killed eventually. And just, you know, if you want to make us happy, you want us happy, just leave. If you stay here, we're not going to be happy. If you reason you want to stay here with us, you're making us a nightmare. So because of that, I left. And I, I got a visa and I came as a student visa here to the United States. Was it hard to, or can you describe what it's like to have your dad saying to you, you should leave? You should leave us. Even, I mean, for a parent to be saying that is is heartbreaking enough. But what you do know, you... Well, he said we're harder than that one. That is still is ringing my ear. He says, "Son, I don't want to with my own hands bury my son. I want to die before you die." That was the toughest thing I heard from my dad. So uh, it makes sense. He say, "If you want to make us your mom and we suffer, stay." So it was it was a very tough situation. But, you know, another thing I can share how proud of my parents I am. So, you know what was the last word they told me at the airport to my ear? Tell me. How open-minded. They say, you know what, son, you're going to go to some country. We might never see you, but we're going to talk to you on the phone. As long as you're happy, you pick up the phone, we are, we are parents. You can feel it. You are upset. Or, as long as you're happy, it doesn't matter. You are married. You are single. You're living with dog. Whatever you do, you do your love. You're going gonna to be happy as long as you're happy. Your life is your life. We, uh, for us, only the left to see if you're happy. So live your life. Don't worry about that. So that was the one open hand for me. Okay, if I left the medical school to become a chef, when they call me, my dad, one question, son, are you okay financially, physically, you are okay? I say, yes, dad, I am okay. And he say, okay, good luck, what do you do? Never question my move wow. from medical school to uh, being a chef. You do end up moving to San Francisco in 1986. You live with your brother initially. Uh, you begin taking English lessons. You you do think that you're going to go into to medical school. You take uh, pre-med studies. Um, when did you know you wanted to become a chef? Or uh, this is the big question we've been building up to. What was the precipitant <laughs> where you go, okay, this is what I'm going to do? Well, the very funny story. Uh, I, my English wasn't good at the time. I used to sit at the bar, watch. The, my brother was in the kitchen helping too. Sorry, your brother. Your brother had a. Your brother had a restaurant, right? That's a, that's an important. Yeah, thing and he was like. also the chef too, okay. the owner of the restaurant. Chef, he was cooking too. I learned, He was my first teacher. 
So he taught me the basic. So what happened was it got busy. It was getting busy. I heard something heard talking about dishwasher. Apparently dishwasher was sick and they didn't have people. They would not let him go home. So I went with the sign language. He was from a Spanish guy from Mexico. I asked him, okay, show me the machine. I can wash it so you can go. And he got happy. So he showed me everything. And he left. So uh, apparently he was busy. My brother, after two, three hours, he panicked. What happened to my brother? He got lost. Where, he, you know, he's new. They say, no, go to grab the back in the kitchen. You will find him. He comes, he sees I am washing dishes. And he was shocked because he hadn't seen me for 20 some years. He, because he expected that I was a spoiled brat young boy <laughs> in America. I am looking for a party. Okay. But he just realized that uh, I am not here. I'm here for serious business. So I earned his respect after not seeing me 20 some years because when I, he left Iran, I was 11 years old. I was a little boy. So I earned his respect. So anyway, then he needed somebody in the kitchen. I needed extra money. So I started busboying. I busboy. And then I, in the kitchen, I started chopping, prepping. And then, anyway, long story short, one day, one of the pantry girl ladies, she was sick. She left, so I took her to the station. And this billboard cafe used to have all the news people, reporters, famous people coming over there because it was an art restaurant. It was all billboard art. So I made the salad, and I never forget uh, uh, Susan Shaw. She was a very high-profile reporter for the Fox News in San Francisco. He, she comes in to, to the kitchen with the, the salads in her hand. Who made this one? And my brother just jumps and I made it because I knew he's trying to protect me in case something wrong. Mm -hmm. She said, no, you, I was watching. You were other side. This gentleman made it. So I look at her and say, yes, I made it. She goes, this is a salad I, did, I have every day. But today, flavor and presentation, the best ever I had. <laughs> that was for me was like, a, okay, I got this. Even though I was making more money as a boss boy because my school, I came to the kitchen, cut my money to half, I started learning in the kitchen. So that was a moment at Billboard. I realized that I want to cook. I love that story. So, uh, so then in 1989, you get a job as a line cook at a restaurant called The Fly Trap, which is going to become a very significant place later in your life. But uh, that is until 19, uh, 2008 when you end up buying it and changing the name to Zare at, at the uh, The Fly Trap. Uh, tell me about the intervening time, um, Haas. T tell, tell me about uh, the 1990s and the early 2000s as you build your resume as a chef in California. How would you characterize that time in your life? Well, that was the time was very harsh for me because not only I was cooking, in San, then I was going to UC Davis. So I was, it's about 76 miles uh, distance. So I was taking a full course of units uh, from 8 to 3 and driving to San Francisco every day work and at night, at midnight, 1 o'clock driving back. So that's why with this new generation, I always say nothing comes easily. Don't look at the iceberg top, that beautiful. Look at how heavy on their knees is holding that little beauty. Mm -hmm. So whenever we in life, we do any major, we have to pay our duties. So I push myself, especially love. But I, it was like a love in the first sight for food and cooking. And then my nickname became Chef with the Four Eyes. He can watch from the back because <laughs> that's how I learned. I didn't go to culinary school. Not only I at the restaurant, when I was cooking, I was watching other people, how they doing it. Like anytime my brother took a break to go to the talk to customer or bathroom, I jumped on his station, I did his job because I used to watch it. And I that was the key for me. And also, any extra money I had, I went to dine at a restaurant to see, number one, how they serve, the whole restaurant concept to see and learn. That was the biggest culinary for me to learn, dining art too. So. This three years was tough. Then in the middle, uh, the restaurant that I wasn't learning more, so I went to fly trap. You build, you, you, your resume builds, your reputation builds. You work your way up as a chef that starts to get really known in San Francisco. Then there is this life-changing event that happens in 2007, Huss, that you, you alluded to earlier in our conversation. Um, Actually, you said in a recent interview, sometimes when you're busy learning, you forget your own heritage. Then something happens in your life that changes your path. In my case, it was the death of my parents. Um, I know it's a very difficult story, and I don't want to as yet, but but if you if you can tell me what happened with your parents and how you found out and how that would lead to uh, changing your life. April 19. April 21st, my birthday. 19... 
Uh, my friends that night at the restaurant, they, they want to take me out for dinner. I was there at lunchtime. Around the 12 o'clock, I said, okay, you guys, okay, I want to go take a little nap. So, because I'm ready for the night, the, the uh, night go out. Around 2, two, two, two one to 2 o'clock, I, my phone rang. And I saw uh, uh, calls coming from Iran. I pick up. All I heard my brother was saying that they, uh, they, they killed it. Finally, they killed him. And I'm like, what? Who killed? What happened? So all I remember that he said, okay, dad is dead. So, but apparently uh, they thought maybe mom is dead too, but mom was unconscious, broken body, bones. But she lasted 45 days, then she passed away too. So um, there's lots of gray area that unfortunately my own sake, my family sake, I cannot talk. So to these days is unknown. A burglar takes a big, the most expensive rock on the floor uh, rather than killing my dad. So uh, all I remember, uh, I can share this one. I used to be not able to talk about it. Um, that, uh, after this news, I remember I woke up in the bed and all around me is the cops. And I'm like, panic. And suddenly this surgeon, this, uh, uh, sergeant comes say, Mr. Zari, calm down, calm down. You're okay. You haven't done anything. You're in a police station. I say, what am I doing here? So he said, last night at 2 o'clock a.m., the officer, they saw you on the highway walking. You cannot walk in the highway. So they tell me you're drunk, and they pull you over, but they recognize oh you. But God. all you were doing just telling them nothing going on. Are you okay? And you were just dropping the tears. So they brought you to a station, and you just passed out here. That's all I remember that 24 hours, the first time when I heard the news. Oh, wow. So it was very tough. So then um, it was very... For a year after that, I have a hard time to remember the memories. It was very tough, very, very tough. So uh, I end up um, having a vertigo, heart attack, all this stuff. But the, the thing is that I know this question kind of come. The food, we, we were talking earlier, food rescued me because of the love for cook and uh, the culture and everything. I remember, you remember earlier I mentioned I, on the weekend I used to cook for my friends Sunday to come my home yes, to cook? Yes, of course, yeah. I remember after a year, I find myself went to Whole Food. I got some food and I brought it home. I started cooking and I picked up the phone. Two or three of the close friends, I called them. I said, hey, guys, I'm cooking some meal. Come back and uh, come here in the afternoon. Let's celebrate. Let's have fun. So that doesn't take about one hour. I doorbell ring and I open the door. I see 25, 30 people at the door. I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't invite you guys. I don't have enough food. But they brought the food and they apparently they called each other, hey, Haas is back. Haas is normal again, and he's cooking. Hmm. So that was a moment I realized that, that the food brought me my back. Uh, and, and then to, to tie everything together, I'm like, okay, food is my love. Culture is my Iranian culture, my life. I love my parents. I love my country. Whatever happened, I'm not going to be the bitter. I'm not going to go to revenge. I, if I do revenge, I become one of them. Best revenge is just show the glory and don't make the victim out of them. So I find that, okay, I, my career picked up from flight trap and I'm going to go for it. And it wasn't for sale, but I approached it. And um, at the time, I pretty much lost everything. I didn't have anything. I was staying in a friend's house. So, but then again, when you have a talent, you have an art, always come back and rescue you. Hmm. So we started from zero again, my friends. They got together, they put a mess on me, we purchased a fly trap, and finally persistent paid up. We bought the fly trap. So and that, the place I started is it. And by the way, I will tell you, fly trap is a 140 years old restaurant's name. It's been back to the Italian history generation. And I was the first one I changed the food to Iranian from Italian concept, American Italian. So, and the city didn't give me a hard time because they liked me. So I got away from that. So this is a story about fly trap, yes. It's quite a story, and and so cooking does food does rehabilitate or or, or um, bring back your life as you describe it, and you do have this next chapter beginning then, which is a big one. Uh, I didn't realize it was your friends who helped you buy the the, the zare at, at Flytrap. That's a um, that's some good friends that you had. Um, so you decide then to focus on recreating and reinterpreting Persian flavors and dishes as you just described. But you do it in this subtle way uh, 
of introducing it very gradually, dish by dish. Tell me about that, morphing the Flytrap restaurant to Mediterranean food, but with a Persian influence. Well, that was a one, uh, again, one, it was, I was vulnerable at the time. I was fearless because if I, right now, if you ask me open a restaurant 2008, I say, hell no. It was a bad timing. It was an economic crash. But again, I was with a passion, food, and again, all I remember later on, I got a message from my friend that they were emailing each other, hey, sh- he is back. We're going to help him. We're going to go as much as we can. But this restaurant has to be hanging in there. So they helped me a lot. So back to the food. When I started food, I'm okay. I know Persian food. I have eaten, but I never cook as a professionally. But I am a, at the time, I can call myself after 30 years of cooking. This month, my, my, I have a cooking skills in my hand, techniques, and all this stuff. So I say, I'm going to take this food. I don't want to be another Chero Chaba B or just stuff that. I'm going to do my interpretation the way I did with Italian food. When I had other restaurants as a chef, I always modernized my way of the Italian food, which is I got a great reviews. So it wasn't new. So, but it, Iranian food was really challenging for me. But also, I knew that I had to work on the presentation, very important, and steadily. Now, I, you cannot just punch people's head and knock them out. You have to go slowly. So I have my own take on the recipes that I want to introduce, but I used to also happily tell the people this is not 100% classic recipes from Iran. These are my vision, my way, like a bone marrow. Or if you look at the picture of the face in June, I took the quail, stuffed it with the old rice and barberries and walnuts in, in, inside the quail, and I roasted the quail, and I topped it with the sauce. I made it separate by uh, face in June sauce. But we never say face in June. We say quail with the pomegranate walnut sauce, with the Philadelphia <laughs> duck comfy. But the Iranian coming, they don't know anything. They eat in they wait a minute, the server. Excuse me, this is seems like the tastes like a Persian for St. June style. And the server was well trained. Yes, this is that. This is our chef Iranian. He does his way. This is his way. And at that moment, there were no place for them to complain anymore because they loved it. But if I would have put a fest in June, oh, this is not a fest in June. Take it back. I want a fest in June that I'm I have a, a, a two pounds of the rice next to it. So, so that's how I start getting forward with the Persian style. My foot at the fly back. Um, Haas, just to, just so you know, you're you're cutting out at times. So just stay close to your microphone or your your receiver yes, there. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I won't keep you here forever. I know you. I, we've kept you for a long time. I'm loving these stories. You know, if there is a through line to this interview and listening to you talk about uh, Persian food and what Persian cuisine means to you and what you suggest it means to the world. It, it's almost like you believe our cuisine reflects Iranian culture. Uh, our food is a way of sharing Persian culture. Maybe that's so simplistic that it's obvious. I I don't know. But is that true for you? Is 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 Iranian food a form of hospitality? Uh, uh, is Iranian food the ambassador itself of Persian culture? 100%. Again, talk about rock. Look at all these organizations. They do seminars, festivals, events, charity. Her, her. Which one they had a sit-down, three-course, four-course menu of Iranian food on their table? That's my complaint. I you know I am not picking on anybody. I am just being rock. Oh, have you seen any Iranian food served three, four course in any of these events? Never. No. no. Mostly, yeah, that's, uh, we, in that case, shame on us. We are the one, we don't want to do that one if we do that one. In another hand, look at the food. In every event we go for us, food is just secondary. All they want to dance and gossip and talk and smoke cigarettes. So even if you do the three, four course menu, Half a dining room is not going to sit there. They're going to go out. The food is going to sit there cold. So it's, I'm, look, I'm talking about both ways. I'm talking about the events. I'm talking about the people, us. We have to start realizing that the best way to, to introduce our culture is the food. Besides the music and um, the, the art and everything. Food is the one every day we deal with that. But unfortunately, we haven't used this tool correctly. And we are not even thinking about it. And this is why complain, not complain, I discussed at the Harvard with the panel we had. And um, same as here, 
So if you have to start from ourselves, from home, right now, facing June, cook some dishes, invite your neighbor who's not Iranian, not just the face in June or gourmet sabzi. Make some other dishes. There are so many beautiful dishes from the different regions of Iran. And in the, with the technology level we live right now with Google, you can add, let's get a decent recipes. And um, or I'd be more than happy if somebody wants any of the recipes not unknown. I can share with them because I, I am lucky right now from Iran. I'm getting bombarded with the recipes. They send it to me. So. I wish I wish I had a restaurant right now. I would have put all this unknown Iranian dishes on my menu. Hmm. You know, before I let you go, let me ask you a couple of questions. One, a um, one a bigger picture one around the trends that you're just talking about in Persian food and and that um, what I call an ambassadorial nature of it, uh, and then a personal one. So, the first question being. Do you think that, uh, largely as a product of migration patterns, you know, there's the Iranian diaspora has has grown exponentially. I mean, it, from 2001, there were two million Iranians outside of Iran, uh, people of Iranian descent. That is, that has quadrupled um, in in the last uh, uh, 20 years, uh, um, and we see a lot of them in, in in Toronto, where I live. There's a lot of Iranians who've come in the last couple of decades. So this is. Um, surely related to that. But I can tell you that as a kid growing up here in Toronto in the 1980s and then in the 1990s, you know, I remember we had one Persian restaurant or maybe a couple, you know, it would be like once a month we would go to the Persian restaurant. Now there are hundreds of Persian restaurants within you know, sometimes back to back on a street, there's, you know, a, a number of them. And and I know this is largely an urban situation in places like Toronto, Los Angeles, uh, D.C., or maybe San Francisco. But do you see uh, Persian food becoming something that can become a, a, a culinary commonplace food the way sushi or Thai food has become in the West, uh, where uh, we will cede the ownership of it happily um, and it will become this kind of international food because Persian food has never quite made that step. You don't see it in the pubs of England the way you would see Indian food, you know? Uh, Tell me what your feeling about that is, having been one of the leaders in this industry over the last few decades. Greatest question. That's what I am right now. We are with the friends we're working on, we're dealing. Okay. I can ask you a question. Do you, any chef, Iranian professional chef, culinary or learn, has a restaurant right now in any way? Not many. Maybe one or two. Right. That Our culture, look at that as a big chef, not even the other, to, to let them other people learn. There's not many, as long as we, there, of course, there's cafes, Persian foods open, but who are these behind people? Like a, a somebody brought 150, 200,000 dollars from Iran, all saving, okay, I might stew my dishes, was very popular in the family, my husband makes the best kebab, we open a restaurant. <laughs> but food costs, right. labor costs, plate costs, insurance, work when come, all these questions, they have no idea. So some of them, they open in six months, one year, they close. So they are not based on the technical of how to open restaurant. And also, we don't have any culinary to go forward. The only way we can do is a handful of the people we have in the United States, for example, or Canada. We use these people as much as we can. And um, in the event, have workshops to non-Iranian or Iranian to show the techniques and everything. All this uh, non-profit organization, they were working on a culture, I don't mention name. Why not they have an open small culinary school for Persian food, Iranian food? That's how we can be successful. But with the social media right now, with the attention we get in, people are getting uh, uh, demand for the learning more. So hopefully all of these, lots of people, they, they get excited. Rather than just blogging, they can start really cooking. It's hard road we're going to go, but I believe it can happen. But in the side note, I can share that I don't want to take too much of the time of the program. I feel we discussed the chef. We are right now becoming the hijack of our food. A lot of our neighbors in Iran, they still in our food. I the other day, I was so unhappy when I saw a New York Times article talks about the uh, frittata we mentioned. 
He said this is frittata, but not a lot of eggs, just little bit of eggs and vegetables. I wrote on my social media, excuse me, why not say this is a Iranian style cuckoo? But right. they don't mention it. So that's for me become like a kind of racism towards the Iranian food, Persian food. Is for us right now is start putting our voice together and move forward. Uh, well, it's interesting because where you kind of went with that answer is is where I wanted to to end off with um, because you talked about some of the ways that um, just the profession itself is seen and you know w- w- that is cooking and being a chef and we often joke about occupational status in Iranians on this program because uh, it keeps coming up the idea that Iranian parents expect you to be an engineer or a doctor um, and and you you've talked about how your parents were very open minded but i would assume that chefs were tradi- traditionally as you've said not considered particularly high status and that has definitely changed in western culture right where Chefs have become rock stars. It's the era of Iron Chef and networks devoted to cooking. And I wonder how much that's true uh, for Iranians now, too, especially for someone like you who speaks at Harvard and is popular on social media and um, has this important executive chef job at Google. Do you feel that your career choice, you can be rock here, has been validated by the status Iranians may give you now? Or do you still wish that Iranians would understand the importance of those who are at the forefront of Persian cuisine. I'm rock. I always tell my what I some people they might get offended whenever. But like I say, still to this date, you don't see anybody will send their son or daughter to the colony to learn the cooking. Uh, uh, most of the companies they bring them from Sharif. These are all brains. You don't see maybe one in a thousand, maybe maybe more or less families send their kids to. Uh, but as long as we encourage them, right now there's that movement I can see from social media. Right, there's a huge movement going on in there. But I hope this doesn't go wrong way. Right now, every Instagram, everybody has a uh, official kitchen. This person, official kitchen. This person, and even sometimes they have. Uh, themselves put it with the chef jacket in the you know, that form is wrong that's uh, for me that overnight be we want to be famous and chef no have fun with cooking be uh, earn your uh, uh, um, crafts first and it's still again i'm not going it's good having a social media bombarded with the persian bl- uh, bloggers and food and everything is amazing but in the other hand we have to have chance to in exercise this one that people they have to study how we can have the culinary school how our kids send them to school or work in a restaurant but so far i don't see that one i'm for and especially with the corona future of the restaurant what's going on it's going to be a tough one chef hoss zare it, it's been uh, an education and such a pleasure to get to spend this hour with you i i i I can't thank you enough for doing this. I can't wait for um, COVID to be over with, although I guess I'm going to have to somehow find a way to become a Google employee so that I can um, regularly <laughs> enjoy your <laughs> cooking. But Or maybe I can, if I'm really lucky, I'll work my way into that special Sunday group that gets invited sometimes to your house. But it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, of course, we make it this happen. We get together one of these days. We have to co- this uh, Corona things all work, definitely. And thank you again for having me. I enjoyed it. Again, one thing for your audience, do me a favor for one month, two months, no more gourmet sabzi, no more gourmet game, no more fessing june. Try search some other food we have. Try experiment. You'll be happy. Trust me. That's the, my message. It's a deal. I love that message. Merci. Vaughan, merci. Khudaf. Thank, thank you. Lots of studies. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. That is Chef Hoss Zare. He is the executive chef at Google with the Bon Appetit Management Company. He joined us from San Francisco, California today. Zareh. If you have thoughts on that interview, 
Uh, you can send them to us at info at rockmedia.com or, uh, you know, post on wh- wherever you're listening to this right now, uh, whether it's on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, or on YouTube. Uh, let us know what you thought. I, I found that, I actually found that really emancipating. Uh, a well-known chef who basically at one point was saying, just make make the food however you, you know, when yeah. I said, can I make the Tacoma Sabzi with chicken? What if I said that? And he said, well, you're going to eat it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> if you true. like it, make it. You right? can't argue with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's yeah. all man-made anyway. But I still think this is controversial. Like, I, I think it's great to hear a chef yeah. say you can make vegetarian versions of these this food yeah. because uh, it takes a bit of the controversy out of it. He's yeah. an authority, right? Yeah. He's an authoritative figure. Uh, I, I still feel like that that's gonna that would be weird like that's if you imagine you go to a mahmuni right mm-hmm. and then they they bring out the the mm-hmm. the kebab the chela kebab yeah. and they go uh, the kebab is actually tofu you know oh. uh, or, the, or they say <laughs> uh the fesen june doesn't actually have any meat in it you know no. keon you're that's, shaking your head it's uh, like putting a dagger to my heart i would i would find a reason to leave that mahmuni you really <laughs> i like my kebab so so uh but but is the meat that important to you as part of For the, me it is. Uh. Like if I was dating a guy and he said he's a vegetarian, I think I would <laughs> I would have to find a way to really release wow. some of his duties. That's a deal breaker. It's difficult it's a difficult life. I like steak, I like barbecuing, wow. I like I like my warm sabzi with meat, man. For those who separately. are uh, for those who <laughs> are potentially interested in a future with Keon uh, be be warned be that warned. you better become meat no, eaters. No, that's it. I eliminated all my chances. <laughs> <laughs> and, Sorry, mom. And and Shia, uh, uh, you, do, do, first of all, how do you feel about the mixture of? Uh, uh, how do you feel about removing meat from from Persian fare? Do you think that's no? That's for me, it's <laughs> unacceptable. <laughs> it's a no-no as, for you too. As Ooh, same wow. as, uh, I can. think you guys are. I, I, see, I maybe I know more vegetarians. But as someone who who knows a couple of people on our team are vegetarian, Ponta is vegetarian, yeah. and she eats a lot of Persian food. But she just finds innovative ways. Yeah. She she even goes to Shatara I was and just gets like the you know just get gets what she has to that doesn't have the meat in it. So she's still enjoying the the Persian food. Yeah. She's like eating cuckoo. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can think of. That's vegetarian. <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? No, cuckoo's great, cuckoo. but how much cuckoo can one <laughs> eat? <laughs> No, no, you could make that. You could have the sabzi polo without yeah. the, you know, maki. Yeah. You I ha- always look for the meat, though, when I have like a dish, like a stew. Well, Keon, you made your position very clear. <laughs> be be sure of that. I'm sure if I taste the uh, Has Zara's vegetarian gourmet sabzi or carafs, I'm sure that I would love it. But yeah. the other thing that was interesting is when he was talking about how um, those menus, even in the, the Persian restaurants, are so uh, confined to the mm. those ten or twelve dishes. And he was, I mean, his message at the end was go beyond the chelo kebab mm. and the and the korma sabzi. There, there is a world of uh, of flavors and and dishes out there. Ashtanduni. Ashtanduni. Yeah. I feel yeah. was that silly that I didn't know Ashtanduni? No, I, I didn't know what. I didn't know. Really? Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. All right. I, no I, I thought that was probably something that everybody was nodding yeah. their heads to. And by I, the way, I love his. His Azari accent. I yes. love his. Yes. Oh, oh that's so, cool. so sweet. But Ashtan Duni, just to explain it to uh, folks out there who, who are not Farsi, Farsi speaking. So Ash is like a is our um, soup s- it's like a stew. It stew. Was, it's like a stew, like a soup. Yeah, and it's usually. Um, it, it can have meat in it, but it's got a lot of herbs in it. Um, there's a form of, of osh that has uh, like a pasta almost, mm-hmm. like a, a noodle a, a noodle yes. in it. Um, and there is osh that has a osh kashka. I don't know how to explain what that is to. Uh, um, no uh, clue. What is kashka? Fortified in yogurt. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, condensed like yogurt. Condensed yogurt. Yeah, condensed but, yogurt. But but uh, but osh danduni. Danduni is dandun is teeth, teeth. tooth, teeth. So so. It's a great name. So it basically means uh, easier to eat yes. with 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 uh, with weak teeth or something, right? Because he <laughs> yeah, said yeah, yeah. it's for. Had you heard of this? I Ash, have not. No, this is it's for. It's like uh, for kids uh, who don't want to. Uh, or is it for babies or kids? For babies. Babies. Yeah. Yeah. But he said it's delicious. Yes, you know, yeah. Yes. Ash, I have to try that. Oh, cool. I'm gonna yeah. call up my mom. But but again, uh, uh, well, I, I mean, everybody, you know, Reza, you came from Iran too. Not well. A longer time ago, yeah. but but Shia, does it d- does it make sense to you when somebody says 
hey guys, these menus are very limited. There's actually a world of Persian food that you're yes, missing. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. You know, it's very limited. Yeah, as you mentioned, and the host said, um, every place, every restaurant that you're going to, is just have قیمه, قرمه سبزی, کرفس, sometimes. Kebab. And then, and then kebab, sultani, yeah. kubide, <laughs> bakhtiari, and that's it. Vaziri, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, what is your favorite non, f- f- favorite food that isn't part of those traditional uh. foods that we think of? Uh-huh. Traditional? Uh, Shaya. Sardine polo. Oh, sardine polo? Yes. Like yani sardine. polo ba sardine fish mi zaran sardine no it's no. not fish it's oh. it's another thing not sardines no not sardines. it's oh. it's with uh, <laughs> it's with carrots uh, kishmish uh, some some of kind raisins of raisin uh-huh. yeah and gushte uh, charg huh. <laughs> <Really? laughs> yeah. minced meat minced meat raisins yes. carrots and, oh, and rice uh, oh and and, and, and it's called sardine uh, sardine, sardine polo. And Sorry, there is no sardine in it <laughs> it's the only it's the only dish in the world that's called sardine uh, yeah. it's a called the sardine dish but yeah. without the sardine I hold think the I'm sardines I'm in love with you Shaya. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, honestly <laughs> like I think <laughs> I hope you he's not that like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no but it's amazing <laughs> well that's I, I, no I'm sure I have full confidence that everybody many people who are listening know yes. what you're talking about yeah. I've never have sardine, you ever heard of I have not sardine polo I, my eyes shot what? out I, I didn't even realize we had sardines, sardines. in our cuisine oh, yeah. and well, then well, he we went don't. on the, yeah we apparently don't. not yeah. <laughs> which part of Iran is it from do you know <laughs> north maybe south? my mom's kitchen <laughs> <laughs> Shai you know you know what you know what we mean when we say sardines, right? Yes, yeah, kind of yeah. fish and yeah. the little the little yeah, fish in yeah, the, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. tins. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So what does it mean? Like, why do they call it sardine polo? What's I, the sardine? I have no you don't idea. Know? Actually, mm. no. It's you a never, trick. You never like, no. Aha! There's no sardines in it, but here yeah. you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like there's a, a my favorite Persian dish is tuna polo <laughs> <laughs> and it involves carrots <laughs> and celery <laughs> but we call it tuna polo <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> seared tuna polo wow. uh, no that's really interesting maybe somebody can explain the the etymology yeah, and, the, the, yeah. the, 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 where though where that expression where I mean I guess we could google, google it but uh, but it's a lot more fun to ask the audience <laughs> sardine polo <laughs> Tell us where sardine polo comes from or if you cook it. I could have asked Chef Haas about this. Yeah. Thank God I didn't waste our interview asking him <laughs> <laughs> this question. Um, thank you. Okay, that was interesting. Uh, and we look forward to your feedback to those who, who are listening out there. It's time for Letters with Keon. Okay, so last week on episode 21, we had an interview with the Israeli-Iranian writer, activist, and translator, Orly, also known as Mojgan Noy. Yes. Um, and then on this week on episode 22, we had an interview with German-Iranian journalist and foreign correspondent, Natalie Amiri. Mm-hmm. And then later we also had Ahmad Kiorostemi. He joined us on, uh, on the show to talk about the continuing the legacy of the legendary filmmaker, his father, yeah. Abbas Kiorostemi. Yeah. But this week, I thought I'd try something different. I want to bring up some letters from older podcasts that we did. We had a lot of, so a lot of viewers end up um, catching up on older podcasts and they write to us on those. So um, So these are older, these are new reactions to some of our older editions of Rook. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. So on episode 20, by the way, that was probably my favorite show. It was uh, the one with Mansour Bahrami. Mansour Bahrami. Also Reza's Captain Reza, one of your favorite shows. Yeah. 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 You love that guy. guy. I love that guy. Who doesn't love him? I ended up playing more tennis after that. I swear to God, almost every day now I've played tennis since that interview. Mansour Bahrami, the great, uh, the Iranian great tennis player, uh, also the great trickster, the great entertainer. So that was episode 20. He yes. joined us from Paris. What what do you have in the yeah, letters? Yeah, so Davir Shah- Shahidi, he wrote to us on Facebook. He said, I am a tennis player for the last 40 years, and Mansur's life and legacy has helped me push through in the sport and keep playing regardless of everything. I played a lot in Ahmad Amjadie, and I know that Mansur's legacy will live there forever. Thank you, Mansur, for being the super talented, humble, and all-around champ that you are. And thank you, Gian and crew, for such an excellent selection of your wonderful interview. 
Lovely. Yeah, and then we have another person, Ali Reza Bagherli on YouTube wrote, this was an awesome interview, one of a kind on, on the tennis court and such an interesting life story to listen to. Thank you for the great interview. Very nice. Thank you, Ali. So that's um, episode 20 of Rook, uh, Mansur Bahrami. If you haven't heard that, we encourage you to listen to that. Thanks, Kian. Definitely. Uh, as well, on episode 8, we had Bollywood actress and model Mandana Karimi joining us from Mumbai. She was talking to us about her story of how much she had to go through just to face her dreams and all the adversity that she had to go through and uh, really interesting and eye-opening story that she shared with us. Yes. Uh, a few people wrote to us on that episode. We have a Minu Farhan. She wrote, I'm so proud of Mandana. She's a brave woman. Bravo. The interview was so lovely. Thank you so much for introducing her. I didn't know her before this interview. As did I. I had no idea who she was. I think very few people. Very in, few. In, yeah. on, in the West, mm -hmm. anyway. Yep. Uh, obviously, they know her in, in, in India and parts of yeah. Asia, for sure, in Indonesia, too. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, yeah, I was surprised that a lot of people, I mean, she's got a million followers on Instagram, but yeah. they're not in North America because no, we had a lot of people saying, oh, my God, mm. who is this person? We discovered her. Yeah. Um, mm. Mandana, uh, carry me. And she's... It's kind of doing big things in, in India, yeah, right? In Bollywood, yeah, very, very as a model. Yeah, um, she's really interesting. Um, and then we have another person who wrote on YouTube, Rico Bonyadi. Uh, he wrote, Wow, finding an hour of something to stop the clock and take you away to the past and hear about the struggles we've all had in our journey. Thanks to Mandana for trusting and sharing her bittersweet feelings and experiences. And finally, huge thanks to Gian for his mastery in the art of storytelling. P.S. If you ever produce a car ride interview, your <laughs> car should be the Gion, <laughs> aka Citroen. I have no idea what that is. Is that what? a car? What? No. Yes. I'm named after a a lemon, a, a, ah. a, a lousy car <laughs> that everyone complains about, but it's cute. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, yeah. that's all that matters. Actually, I'm not named after it, but <laughs> I found out halfway through my life uh, the Gion. so far that my I was named after that car. Yeah. And people go, oh, like the car, and then they laugh. <laughs> and then you're like, what? what? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this poor man's car. Shida Gion, on the other hand, courage of the lion, strength of the lion, you know. That's another way. I'm going to stick with the crappy car. The crappy I'm car, yeah. I'm kidding. That's more realistic <laughs> yeah. for you. No, for no, me. no. no. <laughs> I like teasing. So um, uh, anyway, thank you to Rico. That was a beautiful letter. And and uh, if you want to hear that Mandana interview, uh, it's uh, episode eight yeah. on whatever platform you sure. consume us on. Yeah. yeah. So going back even further on episode two, we had Farinaz Lari on the show. She was the first Iranian woman to win the World Kickboxing Championships. And honestly, uh, I'm sure a lot of girls looked up to her after mm -hmm. hearing that. Mm -hmm. Really courageous woman. Uh, we had a Kave Ansari on YouTube wrote, thank you for this interview, Gian. Farinaz is a monument to the warrior women of the world. Great personality that she is. Nice. Yeah. You know what's interesting? A friend of mine who uh, was from here, his mom lives in Vancouver. Uh, I introduced him to Rook, so he started listening to the to the episodes. Messaged me a couple of days ago. He was like, I just walked by uh, that girl that you had on episode two of Rook. I just walked by her gym. I just walked by her oh, gym. Wow. I saw her working out, whatever. Oh. I, was, yeah. I wonder if Fanny knows his gym is reopened yet. I, I think so. He too, was yeah. prob or I don't know. Maybe He might have uh, walked by the gym without it being open. Maybe, we should get maybe. in touch with her and get an update on... Uh, um, no. Because they had just closed it. That was, I mean, that was our second episode. That was, yeah. So it was a couple yeah. months ago. They had just closed it Literally, down yeah. because of COVID. So, uh, yeah, we should find out. Let me, let me figure that out. Um, thank you, Kian. Or, uh, who was that letter from? That was from Kave Ansari. Kave. Thank you, Kave. Yeah. And guess what? Boy. Guess what time it is? Time it's it. the letter of the week. The letter of the week. <laughs> Okay, so going back to episode 18, we had Persian hip hop superstar Airfan on the show. Uh, we have a username on YouTube. The user's name is I love you for your laughing. That's mm. not their real name. Uh, so I don't know if it's You're a guessing it's You're not guessing. their real name. You're I guessing. hope it's There's not their real wrong name. With it if Some it is. people are named <laughs> Gion uh, after I a know. car. <laughs> Imagine the I, horror. I, I, I love your. I, what's, it, what's the name? <laughs> I love you for your laughing. Uh, I love you oh, for your good. laughing. Yeah. That's, that's actually a lovely, like that. lovely sentiment. Yeah, yes. it's cute. Okay. So he or what she, does I love you for your laughing say about it? He or she wrote, I've been a 
diehard fan uh, of Erfan since I was a young child, growing up with Iranian rap music, just like Erfan, and back and forth between the States and Iran. Erfan growing up was always my favorite and forever still is. I've never before heard Erfan sp uh, speak for over an hour. I, heard, I learned so much about him and I never heard from him speaking English before. Impressive. Ashiqatam Aziz with a heart. Hmm. I loved it so much. I can't wait to convert this into a MP3 so I can listen to it later. Wow. Also, I learned so much about our own culture from another person's dif uh, different eyes and views. I couldn't stop listening because he really is the Persian godfather of rap. But we really do suffer like this, and inspirations like Erfan are the reason we continue to follow and support them without hesitation. Thank you, Rook. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. That's it's a great a letter. We should, we, we, get, we should send that to Airfon. Sure. He would love to hear that. Yeah, that's a nice That's message. really nice. Thank you. Good good letter. You. Good letter. Yeah. Do we want our audience to be converting things to MP3s, Captain Reza? Or do we uh, uh, don't we want them to just listen to it over and over again on our platform? That would be more helpful if they do that and <laughs> share it on their social media. Right, share it. Wherever they get our This podcast. person, I, you know, I'm What's turning the on the letter of the week person. First I was happy with them. Now I'm... Download a Spotify and listen to it all. A pirate. <laughs> they're taking our, our and content. And they're announcing and it too. I'm going to pirate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do about that? Not much. No, yeah. listen. Uh, do whatever you want with our content. We hope you enjoy it. And uh, But if you want to listen to it on our platforms, that's great too. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, Keon. Thank you to the letter writers. Keep them coming. Uh, thank you, Captain Reza. Can I say Th something? Oh. Sorry. No, no. But actually, I just searched at uh, Sardine Polo. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what did I do? I was just uh, saying goodbye. Like, I was in the middle of goodbyes. Right in the middle of goodbyes. Shia, can I? Some technical no, Yes, Groovy Shia. I, I Go just on. searched at, at the Sardine Polo and I, I couldn't find anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's a made up food. And it's I, not actually, real. I, no, but it's all, it's all uh, the recipe of cooking sardine fish. Sardine fish. So <laughs> right. I have to ask my mom why. Yes. Please you report get back to, the bottom of this. Yes. to us uh, I, yes, uh, definitely. on uh, Monday's episode. I, 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 f I, I just have to say that I was wrong. I, I have well, to you ask might not be wrong. Yes, no, no, I, you, I have you, to ask my mom. Yeah, that because you, know. you remember it yes, being called that. So yes. just because you can't, yes. just because uh, out of billions of people, no <laughs> one's ever posted anything to do with sardine polo doesn't mean it doesn't exist. <laughs> True. Yeah. 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 It just takes True. one person to say otherwise. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Um, okay. Our, can we say goodbye now? Yes. All right. Sorry. Thank you. And by the way, Shia, I think you've selected because um, Chef Haas is uh, from Tabriz, uh, Azeri. Uh, you, you, you were going to find some Azeri music that yes. I've been listening, hearing Azeri music coming out of the, the sound booth for the last few hours. So what did you come up with? Uh, it's, uh, it's for a, a female singer named Shokat Ali Akbarov. Okay. And uh, um, it's called Mahni. I couldn't uh, pronounce it. The other way, yeah, but it's it Mahni? is Mahni. 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 Something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So. What yeah. What year is it from? It's for about. Uh, I. Take I your time, Shia. <laughs> People <laughs> listening have all the, all the time in the world. Mm, uh, I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. It's not like we got a life. A, I, I know it's a very old. I mean, about uh, uh -huh. seventy eight. But years you ago. and tell and tell tell us why you chose this piece. Because it's. Uh, I love it. You know. Okay, I, I, it's Azeri, it's and you love it, and yeah. you felt like it was the right mood to leave yes. this this uh, yes. this episode yes. with yes. Chef. Yes, okay. and 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 I, I'm sure that he 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 knows this song. Okay, yeah, all right. Sure, yeah. We'll see if my mom knows it too. I'll see the see if the Tabrizi. Uh, Azari crew yes. know this uh, know this song that you're about to play listen thank you so much uh, for listening uh, to Rook this week thank you to our incredible team uh, thanks to Merta, Muhammad, Susan Ponta, Shia, Reza Keon uh, and everybody who supports us and, and helps uh, spread the word on this uh, new show of ours remember to get in touch with us at info at rookmedia.com I'm Gian Gameshi take it away Shia Mizun Bashin Mashka.